Take five. Five questions to authors and artists. With a common question, we get a personal perspective on what shapes their views. Mike Knowles, welcome to Audiobook Radio. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to hear about your new book, The Buffalo Job. But before you read an extract or talk about that, I was wondering if I could ask you the five questions that we ask all authors. Shoot. Okay, so what is there a book that actually inspired you to write? Uh, the book that probably started it all off for me was uh, The Hunter by Richard Stark. Um, before I started getting into books like crime novels, most of my stuff that I got was from, you know, grandparents at Christmas time or whoever the school library had. But I happened upon uh, an old dog-eared copy of The Hunter, and for me, it just it blew my mind because it showed me how cool books could be. I had never seen books like that before, and when I started reading them, I realized there was a world out there I had never come across, and so it was a gateway drug for me. I started going through everything Stark had written. I did Westlake after that, and then it went from like Hammett to Chandler and just on and on and from right there I figured out I wanted to write books like that I wanted to do something like that mm. and how can I ask how old you were at the time ish around 14 or 15 oh, so that's it was quite just well wow, it was just one of those things the, where the I movie writer. <laughs> well I didn't start putting pen to paper then I always liked stories and things like that but it was one of those things where I just was getting old enough to get out there and, and just hit used bookstores and things like that and I just, I was lucky enough to find it because mm -hmm. I've been to millions of bookstores since and haven't come across it again. Mm -hmm. So it was a really lucky stroke for me. Yeah, without doubt. Is there a book that you wish you had written? There's not really a book I wish I'd written, but there's things I see in books that I wish I'd thought of. Um, Don Winslow is always like that for me. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Sorry, you oh, were saying, cool. uh, Don Winslow. Oh, yeah, go for it. We'll just start over. Uh, is there a book that you wish you'd written? It's not really a book I wish I've written per se, but there's times when I come across books with things in them that I wish I'd thought of first. Uh, Don Winslow's always like that for me. I know when I read Savages for the first time, there's stylistic things he does and the way he plays with words that just blow my mind and they change the way I feel like a crime novel could be written. And it makes me really jealous sometimes when I see that and go, God, I wish I, came. I thought of that first because it would have been you know, something really cool to explore. And then to audio books, do you actually listen to audio books yourself? Constantly. Oh, great. Like, if I pull my phone out right now, I have four books on my phone right now. I have are you listening to? Yeah, uh, when I walk the dog, I walk the dog twice a day, and so there's always audio books going. Uh, I just finished The Lincoln Lawyer. Um, I'm reading Argo right now. And I say reading because to me it's almost the same thing. You said both books that have, you know, been made into movies. Had you seen the movie and then decided to read the book? Or? I haven't seen Argo, and I, I've made a commitment to... I have it in print, and I have it on audio, and I kind of jumped back and forth because I wanted to read it before I saw the movie. I had seen The Lincoln Lawyer, but I'm a huge uh, Michael Connelly fan, and so when I saw it there, I said, I want to really get into this because usually the book is always better than the movie. Mm, and nice. every t like ever since I had kids, I had twins uh, three years ago, and... Uh, the reading time where I can sit in a quiet room and read is diminished immensely. So audiobooks have become this thing where I can get right into them. And it's been one of the best things that's happened to me. Great. So literally, it's been a recent thing. Uh, yeah. Like with the twins' birth and yeah. walking the dog, that's a kid critical. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I love hearing about that because I'm, you know, passionate about audiobooks and have been for many, many years. And I do find that people still talk about it as something that they only do when they're going on a long journey or when they have kids or whatever. When my wife and I used to go on vacation, we used to uh, get them from the library. You could get the big, giant audio CD case with 20 CDs, and we'd go through, like, Ed McBain's on the way out to the East Coast and that was fun then but I, you know, now that they're, they're available digitally everywhere it's fantastic to just get them that way um, even stuff that I think what's great about it is it opens up a library that you don't, you don't have access to so um, I found uh, 11 Doctor Who stories by 11 different authors and I went right through it and I just couldn't believe like, how lucky it was to find it there and just have access to it, it was fantastic so if there was one, is there any single book that you wish somebody would read to you? Or, really? Yeah. 
But I mean, here's the thing. It's kind of sappy, but my kids are getting to the age where they're starting to read. And so they, every, we go to like, they're library carnivores. So we go to the library on Saturdays and they just, they bring home armfuls of everything. And they're starting to read bits and pieces to me. And so I'm really enjoying when they start making up stories and just telling me those kind of things. But there's certain classics that we hang on to that they know the words to, and slowly they're, they're piecing it together. So I'm really hoping, I'm really waiting for where the wild things are, when they can read it. But not just read it. I want like dramatization. I want voices. I want growls. I want the whole thing. But I'm just, I'm dying for it to happen because I can't. I think it's gonna be so much fun. I agree. It's one of my favorites, without doubt. Um, and do you think there's anything that doesn't belong between the covers of a book? No, I think um, I can only speak as a writer, but I think self-censorship is just a really dangerous path to go on. It's sort of like running with your shoes untied. Like you can make it for a little while, but you're going to trip yourself up completely. And it's one of those things where readers kind of respect truth, and writers can really only put things out there that are real, and you'll get away with it longer if you do that. Because I've tried writing things more commercial and doing things that... I think might have more mass appeal and I get a little bit in and then it just falls apart because it's not me, it's not my voice. And so I think censoring anything is kind of a mistake. I think you have to be true who you are and just put it on paper and let somebody else worry about whether or not it's good or if it's appropriate. Okay, so you don't ever worry that you might be writing something that somebody might either imitate or cry. I mean, in your genre in particular, you know, it could be either very gory or it might kind of inspire someone to... You know, no, I've, I've never thought about someone imitating what I do or what I write. Um, I'd hope that would never happen, but I can't say that I would... I couldn't possibly think that if I worried about that, I could ever write anything in my genre because there's always things that uh, that someone could do. I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about horrible things to put on paper and planning them out meticulously and wondering if they work. And um, I don't, I don't ever try and second guess it because I found that whenever I second guess it, I don't do it half as well. Makes sense. Uh, finally. Is there anything, oh no, sorry, in the days before print, do you think you would have been a storyteller? Yeah, I think uh, I was a storyteller before I started writing things down. I spent, um, when I was a kid I had a paper route and my entire time on my paper route was spent just thinking up stories and every day the story would get bigger and bigger and it would just keep expanding in my head and uh, it was one of those things where I always loved to just make things up. And I'm not a huge talker, like in conversation, I'm not social, but I do find anytime I get anywhere in a room full of people, it'll break into storytelling before long. And it's one of those things where I'm really comfortable doing that, and I find I enjoy it. My wife tells me that I don't want to go anywhere, but when I get there, I'm happy to be the center and, and tell stories to people for as long as they'll listen. And I think even with, um, with my kids, Story time has become a thing. It's a half an hour where after reading books, we, I lay on the floor and just tell story after story and they get bigger and bigger. And I think it's just something I love to do. It's just who I am. And if there was no print for me, I'd find some way to get them out. I'm sure of it. It's great, that, isn't it? Yeah. Is there any chance you'll tell us a little bit about your current story and read a little extract from the Buffalo Job? I could do that, absolutely. Oh, that would really be the Buffalo Job is uh, the fifth in a series. It follows uh, a career criminal named Wilson. And uh, by the time we come upon the Buffalo Job, Wilson has um, gone through a number of problems that have forced him out of the city he normally lived in. And he's searching for jobs to plan for people instead of commit himself. Um, of course, while he's on the sidelines, he gets anxious to try his hand back in his old job. And he gets roped into committing a crime. And from there, it leads to a trip across the border to Buffalo to try and steal a uh, priceless violin. Friday at 4 in the afternoon was bustling outside the Art Gallery of Toronto. Two groups passed me as they led tourists into the building. Native Torontonians brushed past me, ignoring the cultural warehouse to their left. I nod to the two men who were watching me with the focus of inebriated birds of prey. The two cleaned up homeless men saw my signal and they immediately lifted their flyers into the air. 
each held up fat pink stacks of paper that had all the markings of a genuine endeavor by the gallery. The barking that came from the two men was eerily similar to an old-timey carny trying to rope people in to see the bearded lady. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, step right up. In effort to increase awareness about the arts, the Art Gallery of Toronto was holding the first ever Impressionist scavenger hunt. Small groups of people disengaged from the herd to listen, but most kept walking. Inside the gallery at this very moment is $10,000 in cash. That's right, $10,000 in cash. The mention of money did what near advertisement couldn't. Everyone on the sidewalk who had been in earshot stopped where they were, changed course, and advanced from the two men in their colorful papers. The two men that I had chosen saw the sudden influx of attention and turned their banter up another notch. That's right, $10,000 free to whoever finds it first. Just complete the scavenger hunt. What could be easier? Learn about art and have a chance to go home with some colorful paper of your own. The flyers started moving fast. Each man had been supplied with 200 sheets of paper. The thick stacks looked to be half of the original height when I passed by the two homeless men and quietly sl slipped each a 50. Nice work, fellas. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thanks, the second man echoed. I let the current of excited people pull me toward the bottlenecked entrance. The swollen line was gaining length and girth and I found myself jammed in behind three teenagers, armed with flyers in one hand and smartphones in the other. They were all updating their Twitter accounts with information about the scavenger hunt. I paid the entrance fee and walked with the crowd of scavengers toward the Impressions exhibition. All around me I could hear people reading off their pages. I had typed up with the help of information taken directly from the AGT website. There were five different sets of instructions in all, enough to keep the entire exhibit pregnant with a litter of uncultured reality TV disciples for at least half an hour. By my watch it took less than a minute for the first security guard to break away from the established writing circle for the duration of his shift and show up in the wing housing the Impressionist exhibition on loan from Philadelphia. It took another minute for the poor guy to realize that he was horribly outnumbered and overwhelmed by the throng and call for help. The night before I had been in the gallery watching the space as it breathed. There was a rhythm in the space, as if the gallery were a hibernating beast. The guards, there had to be at least two more on duty than before the attempted murder days before, moved with the type of efficiency that only boredom-inspired autopilot could create. They circled the designated zone slowly, and then started again. Every now and again they interacted with the, with the patron, either to tell them to step back or to answer a question, but they always ended up back on their practice road. The same number of staff was working today, and within a minute, a lone guard was joined by five others. One of them, a man in his late fifties with a flat nose and thinning hair, liberated a flyer from a young tween and began examining it. He brought his walkie-talkie to his mouth, it was already too late. Woman in the water! It's behind woman in the water! A young woman who screamed her solution to the final clue had meant to tell only the boyfriend beside her, but the herd picked up on the exclamation. There was no painting in the gallery titled Woman in the Water, but there were three paintings on the wall with women near bodies of water. The crowd circled the three paintings of carrion birds. There was squawking from each huddle about the choice before the birds in each, in each group began their slow, timid approach. Fingers began tentatively reaching for the art, but the first shout started a frenzy. The six security guards began yelling for order, but the crowd was too loud for anyone to hear them. Four of the guards plunged into the crowds, but the other two brought radios to their lips. I saw more guards coming toward the Impressionist exhibit as shouts turned to screams. People were being dragged to the floor as more and more bodies surged toward the paintings. Anyone who had been unaware of the scavenger hunt had backed away from the small riot, but they stayed in the periphery with their eyes glued to the chaos. The only exception investigators would find when they checked the tapes would be the man in the sunglasses and hat. I kept the brim low as I passed through the gaze of the three cameras, observing the European art collection. The room was deserted as I approached the 2 by 3 rectangle on the wall. The picture wasn't much to look at, surely nothing to shove wire cutters into a man's brain over, but the art was subjective, I guessed. The attempted robbery had resulted in an increase in warm body security, not in anything technical. I had toured the art gallery the day before with a group. The guy was not enthusiastic about discussing the robbery, but she did, attempt with she did remark with pride that the AGT security measures had made sure he did not lose a valuable piece of art on the sad day of the attempted robbery. She beamed with pride for just a second when she said, the art never even made it off the wall. It was just what I thought. The cable had done its job for the gallery. That would be a confirmation that they did everything right, and no one changes something they've got right. I lifted the artwork and got, six inches, got it six inches from the wall before the wire went taut. I let the art down gently so it was hanging against the wall. The frame had the wire fixed to its reinforced backing. The wire ran from the painting, through the wall, and into a mechanism on the drywall. The wire was coated with a thick rubber that told me cutting it would immediately trigger an alarm. I took off my satchel and unzipped it. Inside the bag was a thick cloth that had been folded into a dense rectangle. I pulled the cloth, unfolded it on the floor, and then unzipped the smaller rearmost compartment. I extracted a small electric handsaw and thumbed the power switch. The rotating blade would go through rebar, 
the thin security chain didn't even put up a fight. The painting came down and within seconds I had it wrapped in a cloth and inside the shoulder bag. The two went back in the small compartment and the bag was back on my shoulder in half the time. If there was an audible alarm, I couldn't hear it over the shouting and screaming still coming from the exact impressionist exhibit. I went down the stairs and rounded the base. There were cameras everywhere. To the right of the stairs, a blind spot that covered four feet. I set down my bag and reversed my jacket. I pulled a different hat from the inner pocket and exchanged caps. The sunglasses changed next and then I pulled a flattened black duffel bag from an inner pocket of the satchel. I put the satchel in the duffel bag and left the blind spot. The main level was chaos as employees did double duty dealing with the small scale ride upstairs and the excited onlookers downstairs. I walked out the front door, passing by two policemen on their way in, who said our galleries were boring. <laughs> Fantastic, Mike, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, thank you. Cheers.